This was a moment that she had been waiting for, but I now want to come to you and confess. It is a moment that I have been waiting for. And Sandra, don't mind that we have to talk some politics here tonight. I want to begin by speaking to you personally and very directly on a couple of things that touch and concern the fate and the future of our constituencies, and by extension, the Labour Party. Now, many of you in here would not understand the critical interrelationship between St. James South and St. James Central. To begin with, we share a geographical border which is more than three miles long. But above and beyond that, that artificial divide which is called a constituency boundary line. It is impossible to find a street in St. James Central where there is not some family who live in St. James South. I went folks from when folks from West Terrace, Sandra, and the 13 Avenues seek to recreate and to exercise, and they go down the steps, they go down to St. James Central and use the playing field at the Shepherd. And the politics in this, therefore, is that when under and going after administration, the Barbados Labour Party sought and began the work of transforming the playing field at Good Shepherd to level and grade it and to put in drainage and at the expense of the people who live in Fitz Village and some who live in West Terrace as well, fleshed out plans, a blueprint that went to the town and country planning and got approved, if you please, and was costed for us not only then to have pavilion but lights as well. And then a wicked, a wicked reptile called George Hudson says, not a playing field, not a light for them. What pavilion walk? As though he is doing something to Kerry Simmons. The viciousness and spite is not on Kerry Simmons. It is on the people in St. James Central and the people in St. James South. Your pain, Sandra, and your people's pain is felt in my pain and my people's pain. And when you look at us in the context of our social interaction, when you go to worship at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Fitz Village, you're finding the cars coming down from Oxnard, Sandra, and they're coming from Wansden, and they come from West Terrace. And equally when you go across at St. John the Baptist Church, the people are coming off foot from, from, from in Hall's Village. They don't only come from in Hall's Village, they're coming from in Hainesville as well. And this, that is the community. And I began on, you know, recognizing Elizabeth's parents because Elizabeth and I sat down in cabinet. And it is common knowledge that we did not always enjoy the best of times. But certainly in one of the better times, we set up a plan where at Hoyts Village, Hoyts New Development, Stage 3, we were able to get 50 houses, and it is in St. James Central, but we shared the house arrangements so that people who were applicants that come from Thorpe's in St. James Central, but got family in George Village in St. James South, and family in, in Hillsville in St. James South, and family in Wansted and in Crystal Heights in St. James South, we made sure that we get them a little something to so that we split it up. And that social camaraderie, that, that approach to developing the constituency and giving people who are neighbors, because let's forget about the line, the artificial political divide. When you're going Thorps and you walk Thorps, on one side of the road, you're walking in St. James South, the other side of the road, you're walking in St. James Central. And there are houses in this constituency because of the peculiarity of how the line is drawn. Where in the front house, you are in St. James South, and in the bedroom, you are in St. James Central. <laughs> and that is true, I was there was campus in all the village, and they asked people what they intend to do. And all of them said, well, let me tell you something, if, if it is that we don't get that lady, all of you coming in the front house, Gary, call me for it for you. <laughs> and I'm trying to take it there and I'll let you know the deal. Um, and we can work out how we can set it up. I can't promise you'll get all. <laughs> but that is how, that is how 
house and try and sell you this, this con these two constituencies in Iraq. And there's a part of it that boils the blood. When you realize then the savageness that has been the Democratic Labour Party's excuse for parliamentary representation. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand what we're talking about. On Santos voting list, there are about 9,000 people. And on my voting list, there are about 8,000 people. And then your name is 17. And across from me in St. James North, there is another eight or nine. We are talking then 25,000. But because a large chunk of St. James, Orange Hill, is now over in a place called St. Andrew. Can you defend the people of St. James this evening, man? George Payne, you need to understand this. That now you add to that 25, another eight or nine, and you're up in 30,000 people. And we have no politics in St. James. That's right. But these people would go up in St. John, and I'm happy that folks in St. John get a long promise polyclinic. But I understand social science. I understand that you begin by doing a social survey to assess and measure demand in a certain geographical area, man. And I said to you, Dominus, you are a minister of health presiding over a part of Barbados which is densely populated. It borders constituencies equally densely populated. And there are no resources of health care in this parish of St. James. Don't believe this? But you're going to St. John. There is no social inquiry done to justify why St. James has not been mentioned for any health clinic, any public clinic. There is a level, a palpable level of demand when you look at the numbers of people we're talking about. Because if we ain't talking now about living souls only, I ain't get to the children yet. I'm talking about people who are registered to go. And already in St. James, I'm all up in 25 to 30,000 people. And I ask you, where is the social justice? Because in the parish of St. John, you don't have that number to begin with. Secondly, we do not have in, in St. James, and we have to face this reality, we do not have only a middle class society that can hop in a motor car and drive elsewhere. There are poor, poor people living in St. James South and equally poor in St. James Central as well. Folks who have 17 people in one household, people who have dirt for the floor, then the floorboards, people who are still, in spite of all the effort of the Labour Party administration, and despite all the lack of effort of the Democratic Labour Party, still functioning in a situation in which outdoor toilets at the order of the day. These are social and economic realities. And it bothers me that a Democratic Labour Party can make a big song and dance when you have, and as I said here, I, I, I am a friend with no Barbadian getting an advance. But when I see that there is an equality of need and in fact, a morally superior need because of the larger numbers and a more pressing situation in terms of density of population in this part of St. James. Then I said to Dominguez that he's telling the people who elected him. And I said to you, Dominguez, that that's the first thing you want to defend when you come to the polls. The fact that he failed the people who have elected him. Office 
that could not find it possible not only to read and analyze and report upon the Auditor General's report, but will also go further and find as much fault as they could find. That is the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation that we knew. All of a sudden, it has gone silent. You know, and again, we have seen the history of this thing. We remember well when we had a budget a couple months ago, and we saw the analysis the night where Mr. Peter Wickham, whose credentials politically are well known, was part of a panel of all people who were members of or supporters of the Democratic Labour Party, and they were supposed to be analyzing independently the, 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 the budget. But what I do not understand about the Auditor General's report is that we could be in a situation where the issue of constituency councils is but two years old. Two years old is so much. And already the Auditor General has pointed a finger of concern about the lack of transparency and about the lack of financial integrity which is taking place in all aspects of governance with respect to the matters of constituency councils in Barbados. That's only two years old. How on earth do you get nearly half a million dollars of computer equipment? And that computer equipment is not uh, uh, is not assigned to the crown. And at the same time that that is happening, you have people who perhaps do not know better calling in on a calling program in the name of the Democratic Labour Party and talking about how the computer equipment was supposed to be for constituency branches. No, no, you know, and I, I, I say, I put it, I'm not going to put it any higher than this at this point. It is very curious and it is very, very worrisome that so soon in the administration of this thing that they call constituency councils, we can have these issues being raised and an Auditor General asking, in fact, stating directly, that better must be done. But I remember when Mia Molly was making the point that we had to be guarded about it because, not only because of transparency, but how to get there in the first place. Because when we said that it may be better to elect people to a constituency council, we understood then that it was entirely possible, as has happened, for there to be a minister sitting far from the constituency in question, but feeling that he, because he is given power under an act of parliament, has a right to name somebody to sit on a constituency council for a particular constituency when that individual does not live in the constituency, does not work in the constituency, has no relationship with the constituency, but his relationship rather is with the Democratic Labour Party. Now I always say A, I say B. I'm not only going to condemn them because they are good people who I know who are sitting, who are sitting now on constituency councils. In fact, you all have to understand as well that part of the dilution of the argument has been, the way you dilute the argument, is by inviting people who are known to be supportive of the Labour Party to sit on constituency councils. And that has happened as well. That's not an issue. We must not lose sight of the transparency issue which lies at the core of the political debate. Because the minister responsible has to be called upon to explain why it is that you get all this money in computer equipment and where is the computer equipment now, Mr. Minister? Why was it not properly why was it not properly accounted for in the manner it should have been accounted for? That's the issue. And we must revise, we must not revise, we must insist on returning to the issue of the transparency of appointments. Because it cannot only about the be about the Democratic Labour Party and the Democratic Labour Party's interests. It has to be, it has to be that whosoever or whatsoever your share of political interest is, that you must be satisfied that in the appointment of a constituency council um, council member, there is transparency, there is the fullest accountability. And that if you in St. Jean South become fed up with somebody on your constituency council, that you have a right of recourse. And as it now stands, there is no right of recourse. And that doesn't matter who you are. It should
should not be for a minister and a minister alone to decide that this person is functioning or not functioning or functioning adequately if the functioning that is taking place is supposed to be in your best interest and that of your family and your friends and the society and the district in which you live and function on a daily basis. basis. It can't be something that is now, that is a fundamental for you. It can't be just shunted aside and given to some distant minister. And it is an issue that the Labour Party must not lose track of. I go further. I say to you that we must also not lose sight of the fact that this government, did which no previous government in the history of Barbados was prepared to do, and that is that they sought to change the law of the land, having named one man to be the candidate for the highest office under the Constitution with respect to the administration of justice, having named the one candidate, they sought to change the law to correct the deficiency which prevented that one candidate from becoming a Chief Justice. It is unprecedented, ladies and gentlemen. And comrades and friends, when a government behaves in that way, they have opened themselves to censure. The Labour Party, Throughout the night, into midnight, immediately after budget, and that's how it happened. I don't wish to use the analogy like thieves in the night, but that is how it happened. After a, a week travailing in Parliament, Dale Marshall and Mia Motley, they had to turn around up to midnight and one o'clock in the morning, dealing with the matter of changing the legislation with respect to Chief Justice. Not a word of explanation from the government of Barbados as to what was the urgency. They went to the Senate and they did the same thing. <coughs> to this day though, and that is where I tell you, our vigilance is paying off. Our persistence is paying off. Our determination to show a face like flint and concrete against the subversive attack of this wicked government that will undermine all things good, noble, and true is paying off. That is why tonight, he who was deemed to be the only candidate for Chief Justice has not yet been appointed. <laughs> because they're saying, how much further do we risk going? Because people stood up in the name of that which is good, noble, and true. And the Labour Party must continue. When you heard Santa speak tonight, you heard a candidate who has committed herself to that course. I say to you as well that you can go through them sector by sector. I am one who will never agree that we must remain silent on the issue of housing, for example. Do not shy away from any of the governmental departments. All in our, all are in a mess. All bar none. The same said all the general. Yes, we can see a lot of flurry of activity. We do know that two billion dollars, two billion dollars in government government backing has been directed to one particular construction firm, right? No worry about that, you only know. We must also understand that it is not just a numbers game in terms of how many houses are constructed in what space of time. The Ministry of Housing goes further than that. And there's an integrity issue in the Ministry of Housing as well. That the Ministry of Housing can have a contract in place for land, for, for property to be leased and pay for it for a full year, for a full year. And the Department of Government was supposed to be the tenant, but the Department of Government never wants moving to the place that was leased. And not a fellow has been asked what happened with the money. Who, who is the landlord? Who is the landlord that benefited from a contract under which a Department of Government is paying to be occupying your premises, Mr. Landlord, and the government department don't move in. The Minister of Energy has not said a word. He is struck, mute. No one has pressed him to say a word in the press. And that is one of the dangers we face with great respect to colleagues present. But I say that the third, the, I say to you that the fourth estate has a role to play. And this is not only about the Barbados Labour Party protecting, protecting this society. It is for the advocate to have questions on the page. 
It is for the nation to have questions on the page. It is for Voice of Barbados and CBC, which is paid for with your money and mine. It is for CBC paid for with your money and mine to transcend the simplicity of Peter on politics and let us get to understand some clarity about politics. That's what this has to be about. And I say to you, you can walk from government department by government department. All bar none lay themselves open for serious scrutiny and criticism. And the Labour Party cannot therefore turn its face away from this. It is a challenge that we have to deal with. I take no pleasure as a Barbadian. I take no pleasure as a Barbadian in observing what has happened to this country during the course of the last three years. We know what has happened to us economically. We are seeing what is happening to us socially. We are now saddled with the Prime Minister who refuses to speak sensibly or seriously to any plan. He had to be pillory to part his lips to speak, and when he went to speak, it would have been better that he remained silent. And it is a serious thing. It's not a lot of laughing. When we were in government, a week or months did not go by. Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, Henrietta Elizabeth carried the fight for a new energy sector in Barbados. Mayor Motley was there, Dale Marshall was there. A week did not go by. We went up to the, the just off the coast of St. Philip. We did everything we had to do legislatively. All the question of bringing in people to, to assess what would have been the oil wells opportunity to exploit. Nothing has happened in that sector since the government has changed. And the Prime Minister has come at a time when the cost of energy is higher now than it was then. At a time when the situation economically in Barbados is more precarious now than it was then. At a time when this new sector is more urgent for this country now than it was then. Especially as tourism is underperforming now when it was not then. Especially, especially because so many other sectors are underperforming now when they were not then. And the Prime Minister can't tell you anything about the future of energy in energy exploitation, alternative energy, anything to do with it in Barbados. Other than that, to say he did not know that we spent so much money on importing um, fuel. <laughs> and ineptitude I do not know what is. So that from his own lips, from the short has given you the very best reason why he has the go. From his own lips. And the more you look at them, the more you look at them, the more deplorable and worrisome the situation becomes. There is no hope. There are no alternatives. They beat us and beat us relentlessly on cost of living. And no matter how we try to argue the case and demonstrate to them that things were in fact being done to manage the cost of living in Barbados, we were told that job number one and two and three would have been cost of living. And that with the stroke of a penny making an X, Barbados would have been transformed where they would be paying no more, no more crying, no more tears. And what has happened with the cost of living? Every single sector, every aspect of everything that you purchase as consumers has been increased. And it does not suffice to say that it is all because of an international economic situation. Because we demonstrated, we demonstrated by going to CARICOM and by taking the opportunity to exhibit leadership at CARICOM that it was possible to rearrange the common external tariff so that all products produced outside of the region but imported into the region would pay a lesser, a lesser tariff as it comes into the region so as to ease not only consumers in Barbados but consumers in Jamaica and in St. Vincent and St. Lucia as well. From the short has been to several of the CARICOM meetings as a Prime Minister, not an initiative. And it goes further. We have said repeatedly that if you take the opportunity to roll back the excise on energy, you will be helping people at the point of the pump. You will be helping people pay a little bit less for gas, pay a little bit less for diesel. Nothing 
has done. As recently as last week, the sickness saying, he will look at him. He has been looking at him. No decision has been made. And every single day, the price of fuel creeps a little higher internationally. And therefore, because of the miserable failure of a policy where they pass everything on to you, in spite of all that we have begged them not to do, we are still in a situation where we have now to pay far more than we should be paying. And so, my friends, I say to you, there is much work that we need to do. This evening, with respect to St. James South Sandra, as I said, is a point which I have been waiting on for some time. There is much, I think, that we can do and should do together. I think, and I want to say here now, that I have been mandated by my executive in the previous weeks. When it became in, um, obvious that it was inevitable that this day was going to come, that we should at the earliest possible opportunity have both branch, both branch executives sit and talk because of the reasons that I have earlier outlined. There is such a close interrelationship in terms of issues, in terms of geographical reality that our two constituencies have to deal with. In a simple, very simple way, you know, in a very simple way, a security issue in Prior Park, Sandra, is a security issue for you as well as for me because Prior Park is you and it is for me. It, uh, if, you, if you think of it realistically, if you have flooding in Denny Road, your folks and my folks are trapped in their homes. And, and that, is, that is replicated in several districts across, across this transition. I, I, and you do it, but you don't bother. Yours is a special case. But my friends, I came here not only to say what I wanted to say, but I came here to say one other thing. And that is that I believe, and I don't know what you hear, but I can tell you what I hear, that people in Barbados are absolutely dissatisfied with the performance of this government. And I hear as well that they want in the Labour Party, they see in the Labour Party an alternative government. They want for the Labour Party to have its house in order so that the Labour Party can govern. That, that is not beyond us. It is not something that is impossible for us. There has always been, throughout time, differences of opinion and differences of ambition. The reality of democracy is that we will not all have what we want, when we want it, in the way we want it. But there is a larger collective, and in this case, it is the Labour Party. And the Labour Party represents, in the eyes of the people of Barbados, an opportunity to save this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg of you tonight, and from henceforth, let us direct all our energies to the salvation of Barbados and rescuing of this land before our home.